Terve, React Finland. Uh, minä olen Patrick. Uh, minä puhun Suomea Muttavehen. Uh, so maybe let's switch to English then. Um, I'm super glad to be here uh, since I have a very special relation to Finland. Uh, maybe you can see it also on my Twitter handle, uh, which is Rüpp. And uh, yeah, so. Where does this group be coming from? So I've been uh, living in Finland for uh, a few months, working on the university in La Peranta, and uh, had a very great time there, uh, enjoying the student culture. Uh, so about me, I'm uh, very interested in this kind of uh, static type system topic. Uh, tomorrow is going to be this, uh, the two-year anniversary when I started uh, talking about Flow publicly. So I think Flow was in version 0.20 or something, and now it's, I think the latest release is 0.72. So in two years, they had a huge progress, and that's one of the reasons why I'm really, really excited about Reason ML, and I want to share some information about that. Uh, again, to go back to my Twitter handle, so I'm a huge fan of Steak Dog, <laughs> so. Um, the Finnish people will probably know him if, uh, if you're from, not from here. Maybe you check out his uh, Rüppi song. It's a very nice song. All right, so let's get into it. Um, the topic, is, topic of this talk is how to make the clicker work. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. Logitech. Hmm? All right, so my topic is making unreasonable states impossible. And before I dive into this topic, it won't let me. So before I get into this topic, uh, it's going to be a topic uh, which is about type-driven development. And type-driven development is not really bound to a language itself. So most of the stuff, I like to refer to certain uh, talks and papers and blog posts, which I really like. Um, Jaron Minsky, who is very famous, uh, uh, in the OCaml world, he was talking about uh, all the stuff I'm talking about um, uh, already like, like several years ago. And there's also some uh, very nice talk of, um, of Richard Feldman. Uh, you probably know him from Elm. And he tried to statically type CSS as well. So it's a very well-known topic, and I uh, encourage you to check these out if you're interested in that. So for me, it's... It's a very abstract topic, so how can I make it more approachable so that everyone can relate to it? So what I like to do is, I like learning by doing, and for a reason in OCaml, I decided, or we decided at Reason Vienna to uh, implement a tic-tac-toe game. A very trivial game, very simple rules, very easy to follow. So maybe to, to warm up a little bit, let's make a first attempt which is the JS implementation, just without any types, because everyone should be familiar with that. First of all, we want a component which is tic-tac-toe. So we define a state for it. And it has a board, it has a progress, and it has a player. And as you can see, the progress and the player are all strings. So the progress can be turn, win, or draw, and the player can be cross, circle, or empty. And the board itself is a box uh, a two-dimensional grid with uh, three fields each. So board, presumably, is an array of certain elements. And now you can probably see what's the problem here. So as a consumer, you have no idea what's going on. Because you see there is a progress, you see there is a player, but you have no idea how what other values there are. And I think Nick talked about it with uh, the arrow component, when you have directions up and down, but you don't know if it's left or right, or maybe it's uh, a different word. So this is a problem. So maybe make it a little bit more uh, idiomatic with types. So we start to add some types with flow type. Um, just to get an idea, who of you has been using flow type or TypeScript? Just raise your hand. All right, yeah, now we're going to places. Uh, for me, it's very important that it doesn't matter which type system you're using, but I'm very happy if you're thinking in types because it makes it much, much easier later on if you build APIs to bind to these APIs because they are built with aesthetic types in mind. So let's, let's start out with types. We define a token, which is um, like a union of string literals. We have cross, circle, and empty. So that's nice. Now we know what kind of uh, types there are. Then 
We have a board, which is an array of token. We have a player with cross and circle. And we have a progress, which is turn, win, and draw. And now we can define our state very cleanly with a board, progress, and a player. But the player here is either player or null. Because if you have a win condition, there is a, uh, there is a player. Or if you have, or let's say, you have a turn condition. So someone is, has to do a, um, to t uh, tick a box, they have to, the, there needs to be a player inside. And if there's a draw, there's no player, because draw is like nobody won, right? So this is a confusing design, since what happens if we have unintentionally um, initialized a state with progress win, and then there's no player who won? Who has won? Player null has won. Doesn't make any sense. And we see this many times in UIs. I even saw it in Slack where it's saying, like, uh, user null was joining the channel. I don't know what this was about, but apparently this, uh, this null pointer exceptions and this null references are really a pain. So let's make this a little bit better. And for that, we just refactor it, because it's possible to express um, this a little bit more cleanly to make it a little bit more impossible. So what we will do is uh, we will define an intersection type. And you're probably familiar with this if you have been using Redux, which would be the action types. So we have uh, objects with a sh uh, common shape with an intersection of type. And it is either turn, win, or draw. And if it's a turn, it has a player uh, attribute. Or if it's a win, it also has a player attribute. If it's a draw, there's nothing. So now we can just skip this. And we inlined it into the progress. And now it's a little bit more idiomatic. And when we are now trying to consume the state, let's see, we define it here. How would we like pattern match on this? How would we go into this? In Redux, we would usually have a reducer, which uh, has a switch statement in there. We also have that here in the progress. So if it's a case turn, we uh, get out the player object and or the player name and uh, return a string. And the same if we go into the win condition. But there are several problems with this. So first of all, switch is not an expression. And that means that every time I have to define the return statement in each branch, if I uh, forget the return statement, or actually, I cannot even assign uh, the result of the switch to a variable or to a binding. It's not possible. So this is kind of a deal breaker if you try to build more functional composition uh, uh, stuff. You will see this later on in the examples. Um, progress is a type of object. So we have a very complex type definition, which needs to be an object during runtime. And I find this very cumbersome. First of all, we have to initialize objects all over the place. And second of all, it's very verbose in the syntax. Then we have another problem. The, the flow infer is sometimes brittle. It really depends if you have uh, several cases which uh, sound similar and they have a player attribute. Sometimes you go into the wrong case and you, you forgot about that and then you consume a player which is sometimes a different uh, type and then suddenly everything is kind of like buggy. Um, I had this many times, especially with Redux. Um, also, maybe uh, you noticed it. There's a typo in there. Did you see it? No? So case winner doesn't actually exist. Um, it's, it's win. So sometimes I did this as well. So then uh, people go ahead and create a file with constants, and then they export the constants and import them everywhere. And then it's just like, um, it's just, yeah, I, I don't like it at all. And there's also no checks for exhaustiveness, because we didn't check the, the draw case as well. And nobody told us that. There are tricks to, to make Flow tell us about it, but it should be doing it by default, in my opinion. So let's see. Ah, oh, yeah, also verbose syntax. If we miss the return statement, it doesn't do return anything. So let's design the state in reason. So first of all, we have a token, which is cross, circle, and empty. And these are tags. They don't have a concrete value. They are just types. We have a board, which we will define later. We have a player, which crosses circle. We have a progress, which is uh, a variant. 
And now we have the turn, the win, and the draw. And the turn and the win have a player object in there, which we can pattern match on later. And we have a state, which is exactly the same as in Flow. It looks like Flow, but uh, you will see it's much more sturdy. So let's see that in action. We define a progress, which is of turn cross. And now we can just switch on that. And there are several advantages of this now. First of all, we have exhaustive pattern matching. If we leave out a case, it will tell us. Second of all, all branches need to return the same value. And as Nick said, the last statement in a function body is the return value. So this is returning the, the string. The switch is an expression, so we can assign the return value of each branch to a variable and, uh, or pipe it to another function. And if you look at the syntax, it's also less verbose in some way. I don't know, it's just also, um, I think Sven was talking about uh, scope hoisting. So actually in the case, sometimes you need curly braces, otherwise it will hoist the, the declarations you do in there uh, to the top of the switch scope, which is also not nice. So there are many pitfalls in JavaScript and then you have no type checker, so yeah. So what about the board? So there is um, multiple ways to design this, and this is uh, the core of this talk, actually. So we have a board, which could be a list of tokens, and there is now the problem that we can define. So we, are want, we want to implement a tic-tac-toe, right? Which, with nine fields, the classic, uh, the classic game. So we could define a board, and this will type check uh, just fine. It has, for instance, nine elements in there with empty, 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 empty. Or we have something weird, so we can define this. It has only three elements. That doesn't make any sense because it's not supposed to be like this. It should be nine fields. And we can also do one. And I mean, this is the more generic, more runtimey uh, way of doing things. It's kind of clever because you need to think about um, all, uh, all the list access and, and all the, the exception handling and everything. Uh, you need to, to, to validate the input uh, if you expose an API. And it's a lot of cognitive uh, load, so you need to remember, okay, how many elements did I store in there? Or maybe you manipulate a list somewhere, and then you need to keep track where did you manipulate the list. Um, it's potentially unsafe code because it can break, and we have more tests to write because we always need to check, okay, if I pass in three elements, if I pass in six elements, does it do what I want? So let's make this unrepresentable. Uh, make this unrepresentable board impossible, so we don't even allow that you can pass in more than, than uh, or less than nine values. So we define a row, which is a tuple, which has the exact size of three, three tokens. Then we define a board, which is of three rows, which is also a tuple. So now we can define a row with three empty, and this would be okay, this would type check. Um, if we try to pass in less values, the compiler will tell us, I don't know any tuple type of type row which has two elements. You need to pass maybe three elements. If I try to pass more, then it will tell me there is only one with three elements. Do you mean the one with three? So it's, uh, it's type safe, there is no surprises, and there's also less tests to write because it's, it's just impossible to make the compiler compile uh, when you're trying to put in more values. The problem is, it's a little bit more of a bose, and um, I don't actually care too much about the verbosity if it's just that simple code. It really is like just you just type it. It's not you don't have to worry about too many things. So maybe let's give you an example. Uh, first of all, we need some helper types, so we define um, variants which express a certain selection. So if I select column one or row one. So it's like this grid. So basically what we think, how we think to play this game. And so in, for instance, if we try to get a token from a board, column row, we would get a token. Uh, we have a function get token, which gets the board, which gets the row ID, which gets the column ID, and then we pattern match on all this kind of stuff, and then we go uh, further. It's like this function definition. Then you have a token to the board. So we have update board, which uses update column, which uses, okay, wait, it's too fast, right? Um, maybe let's slow a little bit down and uh, do a little bit of live coding. So um, can you please say yes if you can see everything properly? Is it? All right, nice. Okay. So I have a repository. It's, the link is also in the slides, which I will publish later on. 
Um, so first of all, I will show you the app. It's uh, already complete. So it's a basic tic-tac-toe game. And you can, yeah, you can just play, and it will tell you who is doing the turn. So it's a draw. And then you can also restart it. So this is basically the app. And what I want to show you is a little bit of how it feels to write a little bit of reason code. Because a lot of people tell about it, but they never really show the editor setup. And <laughs> a word of caution, I'm actually sometimes nervous at live coding. So let's see how this turns out. Um, so uh, yeah, if anything goes wrong, I will just curse and finish, I guess. All right. So, so we have our demo here. It's just a module inside our source folder. Um, each file is a module by default, so it will be exposed as demo, uh, like as a demo module. And we have uh, all the elements which I was discussing before. We have a token, we have a player, we have a progress, we have a, col a column ID, we have a row ID, uh, we have a row, we have a board. Then we have uh, just a two-string function for our tokens. So if it's an empty circle or cross, we will just return the, the string representation. And then we have a test board so I can show you what's the result. So let's see how the get token function would look like. So we would define a let get token, which gets a board, which gets a row ID, which gets a column ID. And the first thing we will do is we have a board with three rows. So we need to deconstruct this in three elements like three variables. So we say we deconstruct it in row one, row two, and row three. This is valid reason code. And now row one is, it will tell us it's unused because it is also a linter. The compiler also tells you if, if you're not using certain values. So we see this is unused and this is unused. And by the way, if there is an error down there, this is the BuckleScript compiler which compiles to JavaScript. If there's an error, it will show us the error nicely in the console. It's just running in the background, it's really fast. So if I I just, yeah, you see how fast it compiles. Anyways, um, we also define a from row, which is just an intermediate function, which gets a row. And it will switch on the column ID. Because now we need to find out from a specific row, like this, we need to return an element. So if it's C1, actually, we can, we can also deconstruct it here. So we say, we deconstruct the uh, we destruct the row inside the, the parameter definition. And then we just say on C1, we return T, T1, the token, the first token in this row. If it's C2, it's T2. If it's C3, T3. Hopefully this works. Then we have probably... Oh, yeah, this is something VS Code sometimes does, it just adds parentheses, and I'm not familiar with it. OK, so now we have the from uh, row function. And uh, so what we want to do is we want to get the token. And we pattern match on the row ID, because we need to tell it which, which row we want. So for row 1, we will uh, get from row 1. Uh, from row R2 and from row R, uh, row 3. Does this make any sense? So we take the first row, second row, and third row, and then we already uh, added the column ID in there. So it will, just, it will just deconstruct these two tuple structures. That's all it does. The last statement uh, is also uh, a switch, so it will be automatically the return type of this. And if you look at the function definition, it looks a little bit funky right now because it does a lot of type inference. So if you give it some more type information, it should automatically infer all the values. So it automatically sees the first uh, value is a board. So the second and third needs to be of type row ID and of type column ID. So this is really nice. I think I don't even need to do the token. I think it will automatically know it. So it, it automatically knows that there is a token in there because there are tokens in the board. All right, and to verify this, um, maybe, I mean, this is just each module will be transpiled to a JavaScript module. So we can also just drop in some typical JavaScript, like in Node. Um, so we will call this function here. 
get token, and I already prepared the test board. So it's, maybe we'll make this a little bit closer. So we will just try to access the second element in the second row, which should be cross. So we gave it the test board, and we give it R2. So we cannot even switch it around. We cannot even mistakenly switch around the column and row here. C2, which should return a token. And uh, the token sh uh, should be piped into the token to string. So it returns a string afterwards. You can see it here. And then we pipe it to gs.log, which will do just log. It just does a side effect here. And hopefully, if this works, it should compile. So you can see every time this thing compiles, you can be sure this code should run, especially if you're just in the reason space, because uh, the way the OCaml system works, uh, it's, it's pure in that regard, as long as you don't do any funky JavaScript side effects. So now we want to see the result of this statement. And BuckerScript usually stores the, the uh, transpiled packages, the modules inside the lib folder. There's a JS source. You can find all the JavaScript files in there. And we can just run them. And it's cross. OK, maybe let's try another value. Let's try the first value in the first row. Circa. Here we go. So that's that. And uh, you can imagine, OK, maybe let's do another function here. For instance, is empty token. It's a very it's a no-brainer, actually, because what we do is we just think about the types we pass in and what we expect to come out. So let's define this. We say, is empty token. Um, it gets a token, and it just pattern matches on it. And if the token is empty, we will just uh, return true. And now you see the squiggly lines. It will tell me this pattern matching is not exhaustive. Here is an example of a value that is not matched, circle or cross. Suddenly we know, OK, yeah, maybe we should also cover these cases. I could do either circle cross if I want to be explicit. Or there is a default case, because in many cases I just care about the empty. So we just do the default case, and that's it. It's, it's no-brainer. I don't even have to look at the console, try it out, write chest tests or whatever. It's just like you satisfy the compiler, and everything just works. And this is what just blows my mind, because every time it's like, uh, ah, I need to check for null values. I need to check for this and that and this. Um, you don't have to here. And don't worry about the code examples. Um, everything is on the repository. You can check it out later if you're interested in that. So the conclusion itself is it's a more rigid design. Um, it's more keep it simple than don't repeat yourself. You have to repeat yourself and, and be a little bit more verbose um, for a more rigid design. Uh, it forces all the edge cases to be handled. As you can see with the is empty token, it has exhaustive pattern matching. You don't have to satisfy the compiler because it's just a warning. Sometimes you just always want this, so you can set the warning to an error as well. Um, so you can really have a nice, uh, you have an idea of where the edge cases are. And uh, other alternatives to make this more flexible, because a lot of people will say, what if I want to have a tic-tac-toe with 20 rows and 20 columns? Then it's probably too verbose to write. You can combine both worlds. You can write an interface which exposes um, the board as a tuple system to the user, so the user cannot really, with your API, cannot mess around with it. And inside your library, you just convert it to a list, and then you do your funky stuff in there, or vice versa. And there's this very nice tweet of Cheng Liu, who said, remember high school, different solutions to a problem was fine, but differing units in the end means you probably misunderstood the problem. And this is um, like, whenever I was programming, uh, this applied a lot. Sometimes I was just adding uh, certain, like I was trying to adding some strings, and then I added some object to the string. And I mean, if you try to calculate uh, the volume of a swimming pool, and you try to use kilogram to, to calculate the size, then it's not going to work. And this is what uh, type systems always talk about. OK, so do we have more time for one more thing, I guess? Yeah, we have five minutes. Oh, we have to be fast. So I wanted to show another example of facing querying, but I had no server. So I wrote myself uh, a tic-tac-toe as a service, TTTAAS. And it's written in OCaml, actually. And it has 
actually only one road, uh, route, which is get load. So it, it um, gives you back an initial state, uh, which we can wait on. And we also want to introduce a loader component, and we call it uh, tic-tac-toe loader. So what it does is it has a loader state with data option tic-tac-toe state and loading bool. No, no, wait, wait, wait. No, we don't want that. That's exactly what I was talking about. We don't want this even to happen. Because a lot of people see this in UIs where they were like typing and then the query goes off and it's loading and people are like, is data there? If it's not there, it's probably loading. So they show loading, although the query didn't even happen yet. So we don't want it. We want to make it impossible. So let's see how we can make this better. So we uh, define a type remote data, which is uh, four states not asked. So the request didn't even happen yet. Pending, the request is loading. Success, we got the success, uh, successful result, which is parsed um, as a tic-tac-toe state, and error if something else happens. And so we uh, define a loader state, which is remote of type remote data. And in the render function, we can now access the state. So it's if, if you're talking in a reason react uh, context. So this would be a reducer component. It has a state. And inside the state, we just ask, is it not asked? Is it loading? Is it error? Is it success? And uh, depending on this, we can uh, destructure on, on the data which is coming out as a board in progress and uh, give it to the tic-tac-toe component. So maybe let's show this a little bit. So first of all, the, the server is uh, built in OCaml, so we can just build it quickly, and then it's running on port uh, 8000. And you probably see it very, do you see it? Like, there is a, uh, there's a short uh, time where it is displaying this, but it's so fast that you cannot really see it. Um, I only have three minutes left, so I, so my plan was to, to implement the TTT loader. Um, sadly, I just, I think I just need to copy paste some stuff. So first of all, what we will do is we'll just define the state of the component and we define a reducer component, which is a TTT loader. It doesn't really matter what the string in there is, I think only for debug tools. Um, so there's a loader here. And uh, what we would do is I will just copy the reducer here. Two minutes left. Let's go, let's go, let's go. So we have children. We spread in the component. We have an initial state, which is uh, a function which returns an initial state, which should be a remote data, and remote data is not asked. So in the beginning, it is just not asked. Then we add the reducer. So the reducer, um, pardon my semicolons and colons. So the reducer gets an action and it gets a state. We don't care too much about the state yet because we just care about the action here. Uh, if it's load, we, we just tell it to be of remote data loading. If it's failed, we say error, and reason react update tells the uh, tells Reason React to really re-render if the data has changed. And uh, after that, we just define the render function. And the render function uh, gets a context self, which is kind of like the this reference uh, in JavaScript world. And we will pattern match on this. And we got an error because I probably just copied some stupid semicolons somewhere. Uh, I need a bracket in my switch. Oh yeah, maybe it's this. Yeah, so it's building now. And we have free format as well, so we just whoop. Yeah, here we go, that looks nice. So if we do, if we just go into the app, and I don't even care, I don't even check the output yet, so I just add it here. Since it's a, every file is a module, you can just globally access it. That's it, it's compiling, so I can be sure it works. So it's starting application. Right, and I have 30 seconds left, so, Let's make, it, let, let's make it did mount very quickly. So did mount by design is... No, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> itself, the pressure is it's real. So we just returned, so this, fun, this, this is actually not, not uh, current because today it was a new release of Reason React. 
Um, so we just say no update for now. So this should be the no update because did mount should not do nothing anymore since React 16. Um, and we just say self.send uh, loading or load. Just self-send. So now it's loading the game, right? After it mounts, it, it sends the, the uh, load to the, to the reducer and it will tell it to update and then we will go into this state, right? And for fetching, I prepared a function which basically, yeah, you have to read it up later, um, which does uh, fetch the data. It pipes it to a, a then case, which is uh, the promise interface in Reason. We get the data. If we get it, we send a finished action with the data, and then we resolve it. The same for an error case. We tried. This is a little bit fi uh, finicky, but um, deal with it <laughs> for now. They are working on solutions for that. Um, also for sound promise, because they're not uh, type safe yet. Um, yeah, we send a, a failed, and that's it. And if we, yeah, it's so fast that I cannot even follow. And that's it. All right. 